Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel, Close Reading with me, Dr Octavia Cox. Today I'm going to be talking about Alexander Pope's poem Eloisa to Abelard, which was published in 1717. It was one of Pope's most popular poems in his own lifetime, and indeed for decades afterwards, well into the 19th century. The poem, for example, was called Most Poetical by William Wordsworth, the dominant literary figure in the Romantic period, the period that um, followed Pope's literary period. And Wordsworth said that in 1842, so well into the Victorian age. Today, I want to consider one of the reasons why I think Eloisa to Abelard was so popular, which is this sense of immediacy that is written into the very fabric of the poem. I see Eloisa to Abelard as a precursor to the epistolary novel form. So the epistolary novel is a novel which, uh, in which the story is told through a series of letters. The epistolary novel is a form that dominated the literary marketplace in the mid uh, and latter half of the 18th century. So I'm going to show how in the narrative poem Eloisa to Abelard, Pope develops the same techniques to create effects of immediacy, and the effect of what's called writing to the moment that writers of the epistolary novel would go on to adopt later in the 18th century. And I really like this picture uh, of Eloisa to Abelard. Um, I think it's illustrative of what I'm going to be talking about because even as Eloisa imagines kissing Abelard, she's still there clutching her pen and ready to write. Remember, if you like what I do here, then like this video and subscribe to my channel. Subscribing means that you'll see my new weekly videos when they're posted, and it really does help me out in YouTube's algorithm. Eloisa to Abelard is a narrative poem, meaning it tells a narrative, it tells a story. In this case, it's the story of Eloisa, who is reflecting on and contemplating and thinking about her long lost love and lover, Abelard, who, for various reasons, mainly the disapproval of relatives, um, cannot be together. As the name of the poem suggests, Eloisa to Abelard, the poem is a verse epistle. And that means that it's a letter in the form of a poem. So verse, poem, epistle, letter. It's a letter from Eloisa written to Abelard. Abelard, Eloisa to Abelard. So Pope explains the background and the story in the argument, which is prefixed to the poem as it appears in the work. So the poem was first published in Pope's Works of 1717. You can see the title page there on the left. And in the argument, the story is explained. Abelard and Eloisa flourished in the 12th century. They, they're real historical people. Uh, they were two of the most distinguished persons of their age in learning and beauty, but for nothing more famous than for their unfortunate passion. After a long course of calamities, they retired each to a convent, so Eloisa had to become a nun, and consecrated the remainder of their days to religion. It was many years after this separation that a letter of Abelard's to a friend, which contained the history of his misfortunes, fell into the hands of Eloisa. This, awakening all her tenderness, occasioned those celebrated letters, out of which the following is partly extracted, which give so lively a picture of the struggles of grace and nature, virtue and passion. So the very basic story then is that Eloisa and Abelard are parted lovers. Abelard has written a history of his misfortunes as he sees them, and Eloisa reads them and is very hurt by them. And the poem records her response. You'll also notice, which will become important when we think about epistolary novels, that there's this um, sort of real life back history that's given. So the idea of tying in this poem into this real life uh, facts, apparently, about the story. I want to start with a very quick history of the verse epistle form. So poetry written to someone in a letter. Eloisa de Abelard draws on Ovid's Heroides. Um, 
translated as Letters of Heroines. Ovid was a classical Roman poet. So Ovid's Letters of Heroines remained popular during the 18th century, very probably inspired by Pope's poem. And this here on the screen is an edition from 1732, which you can just make out at the bottom there. And in fact, it's James Boswell's copy. Boswell, you may have heard of as the biographer of Samuel Johnson. Johnson is the great 18th century literary critic. And it says, you can make it out in the handwriting there on the left, this book I bought at Inverness when Dr Johnson and I were together, so I carried it with me during our Hebridean expedition, James Boswell. So we can surmise that Samuel Johnson and James Boswell read this during their famous Scottish tour. Ovid's Letters of Heroines are a collection of epistolary poems written uh, ostensibly by a selection of aggrieved heroines of Greek and Roman mythology. The letters are an address to their supposedly heroic lovers who have actually mistreated or neglected or abandoned them in some way. One of the letters, for example, is from Dido to Aeneas. So he had deserted her and she had sacrificed herself on their marriage bed. And you may have heard of Dido's Lament, for example, which is about the same, uh, the same story. Another example is Medea to Jason, the Argonaut, after he abandoned her to marry Creusa, despite Medea having been instrumental to his acquiring of the golden fleece for which he, Jason, is celebrated. So Epistle 12, for example, opens, scorned Medea, helpless exile, asks her recent husband, can it be that you cannot spare time from your kingdom? So Pope was not the first by any means to draw on Ovid's letters of heroines, but he did help to popularise it in the 18th century. The verse epistle from the scorned, abandoned woman then has a long history. What is perhaps new in Pope's poem is that the, let the power of the letter form is described within the poem itself. We see Eloisa read letters outlining Abelard's misfortunes and Pope presents her responses with immediacy. Effectively, we readers experience her emotions as she reads Abelard's letters. Soon as thy letters trembling I unclose, that well-known name awakens all my woes. O oh, name forever sad, forever dear, still breathed in sighs, still ushered with a tear. I tremble too, wherever my own I find, some dire misfortune follows close behind. Line after line, my gushing eyes o'erflow, led through a sad variety of woe, now warm in love, now withering in thy bloom, lost in a convent's solitary gloom. So obviously this is set in the present tense, um, but there are, there's, there are moments of immediacy that bring it kind of even more... Um, close up in the face of the reader, if you like. So it opens this passage here. As soon as I unclose. So there we are in, in the moment with her as she uncloses the letter, as she opens the letter. And uh, that sense of immediacy is increased with the words, you know, as soon as we're there at the very moment. Um, and the sense of immediate feeling is enhanced by use of words such as trembling and awakens that well-known name awakens all my woes. So when she encounters his name, Abelard, on the page, her feelings are brought back to life. We see her seeing his name written on the page. And in this way, we can say that it's metatextual, which means that it's text that is kind of concerned with itself as text. So in the poem, Eloisa is writing about reading other writing. <laughs> um, and obviously that um, goes on to be fundamental to the epistolary novel, which we'll get onto in a minute, because obviously in epistolary novels, quite a lot uh, of what's written about is a character saying, I 
received your letter. This is how I feel about it. They then send off their letter back to their friend or whoever, and their friend then writes, oh, I've received your letter and this is how I feel about it. So there's quite a lot of that kind of metatextual activity of characters talking about reading and writing. So back to the poem then. On the fourth line, still breathed in sighs, still ushered with a tear. We've got this repetition of still, still, and that con this idea of continuing into the present moment, and it's doubly repeated. Um, and this highlights the immediacy. Eloisa is saying, I still feel like this. I still feel like this. I tremble too, wherever my own I find. So in the word tremble, there's a, obviously a repetition of trembling from the opening line, as if continuing the same emotion and apprehension. And when she reads his name, we, we were told earlier, it awakens all her woes. And likewise, when she finds her own name written down in the papers she's reading, it makes her tremble. So she's responding to their written names on the page of the letter that she's reading. So I tremble too wherever my own name I find. It's almost as if she's kind of reading, searching for a mention of herself. Line after line, my gushing eyes overflow. It's as if we we see her going through the letter, line after line. Now warm in love, now withering in the bloom. And so we've got a repetition of now, now, which of course again brings us very much up to this moment now right here and it echoes the still still of earlier so pope is building a, a kind of tableau of immediate moments piled on top of each other and we have these kind of contradictory images come up as we're led through them so now warm now withering lost in a convent's solitary gloom her sense of being lost and alone um, in situation, so in her external world in the convent, contrasts with the feelings of warmth and immediacy and connection and life that the letters bring her internal world. And the final line draws an explicit contrast between the almost overwhelming passion provoked by the letter and her actual solitary state. And there's a double play on the word lost. As she's been reading, the gloom of the convent has been lost to her. She's lost in the letters. But at the same time, now that her life is spent lost in a convent, the world of passion has been forever lost to her. I want to think a bit more about this idea of immediacy, as though Eloise's thoughts are brought forward to us readers as they come into her mind. We get an impressionistic sense of a mind in action and the ebb and flow of thoughts as they come and as they go. So this is the very opening of the poem. In these deep solitudes and awful cells where heavenly pensive contemplation dwells and ever musing melancholy reigns, what means this tumult in a vestal's veins? Vestal, there meaning virgin. What means this tumult in a vestal's veins? Why rove my thoughts beyond this last retreat? Why feels my heart its long forgotten heat? Yet, yet I love. From Abelard it came and Eloisa yet must kiss the name. So the poem opens with a sense of heavy contemplation. We've got three lines of long vowel sounds that slow down and elongate the lines. And you really have to read them slowly. And then we move to the question, what means this tumult in a vestal's veins? Um, and the vowel sounds become shorter and less elongated. So drawing attention to the contrast between the location the deep solitudes and awful cells and the ever musing melancholy of the nunnery and this, this current, this ongoing and that this marks a transition from the general environment to her specifically, to this particular person. So this tumult within her body, within her veins, obviously representing blood and life and pulses and so on. So we have the three opening lines versus the one line question. 
and there's this partial separation of the opening description of her surroundings and the one line clause of the question that relates to her internal world and note the two uh, comma endings of the first couplet and then a semicolon at the end of the third line which marks a heavier break. From the poem's very opening then Eloise's inner world is separated from her external world and then we have two more questions in much quicker succession. It's as if her mind has been kind of brought to life, not in none like pensive contemplation, but in immediate thoughts and feeling. So why rove my thoughts? Why feels my heart? And this sets up what will be important in the rest of the poem, the roving of her thoughts as she feels different things and that readers see the roving of her thoughts. That essentially is the subject matter of the poem. And thinking about the structure, obviously it has a kind of balanced structure in these opening three lines in that you have three lines and then you have another three lines kind of um, in conversation with each other or uh, balancing each other out. You've got the three slow lines that describe the external world, followed by the three quicker lines that articulate Eloisa's inner world. And these questions that Eloisa is posing to herself, that she's asking herself. And these three questions show us Eloisa's mind in action. What does it mean? Why am I thinking this? Why do I still feel this way? And I'm sure all of us who have kind of had these moments of heart ache and, and so on. Those are the kinds of questions that you ask yourself. What does it mean? Why do I think this? Why do I feel this way? Um, and then we have the beautiful interruption, the beautiful moment. Yet, yet I love. And this beautifully interrupts and disturbs the rhythm of the heroic couplets that we've had so far. So each monosyllable has equal kind of emphasis placed on it. And we've got a hard pause, the exclamation mark and the hyphen. And this is the first caesura, so the first pause in the middle of the line that we've had so far in the poem. And you'll notice that all the lines above this one don't have a pause in the middle of the line. So this hard break interrupts the rhythm of the poem as if this thought interrupts her own self-questioning. The answer strikes her. The hard pause lets this thought then hanging the air in mid line draws attention to itself through its kind of oddity. We've also got another another repetition. Um, so um, setting it up for, for when it will appear later in the poem here, it's yet yet. So earlier I was talking about the still still and the now now. But yet yet again suggests time that continues into the present and setting up again this idea of immediacy of recounting feelings happening right now here in this moment. Um, and then we have the repetition of yet again in the final line. We can see Pope's repeated use of the rhetorical three just in this small section then the first three lines describing the nunnery and then the three questions and now it's the three yets in two lines. Yet, yet I love from Abelard it came and Eloisa yet must kiss the name. Pope beautifully links the two ideas in the repeated use of yet. Yet, yet she loves, so she yet must kiss the name. So Eloisa is reading Abelard's letters and when she comes across Abelard's name written on the page, she kisses his name written on the page because she loves him still. And the final image from Abelard it came and Eloisa yet must kiss the name draws on the kind of interesting relationship between a person's physical being and them represented via the written word. And this in 18th century epistolary novels, this is also and indeed in personal letters as well. This is a kind of theme that comes up yet again and again, this idea of, of a letter kind of standing in for the physical presence of a person. So Abelard's written name here is a substitute for Abelard's person, but also Abelard's letter is a substitute for him. So Eloisa kisses the name on the page because she cannot kiss the man. 
the letter is from Abelard. It is a physical kind of embodiment of him. He has touched it. She is now touching it. So they've almost physically touched. By kissing this page that he has touched, she is almost kissing him. I want to think now again a, a bit more about this idea of immediacy and it being integral to the very fabric of the poem. And that's called um, writing to the moment. The technique of writing to the moment is associated with the epistolary novel form. And the term was coined by uh, the great kind of 18th century novelist Samuel Richardson in his famous epistolary novel, Clarissa. Uh, Clarissa was published about 30 years after Eloisa II Abelard. It was published, as you can see from the bottom there, in 1748, and it continued being published until and the next year, until 1749. Clarissa was a, a groundbreaking novel and one of the most important novels in the whole of the 18th century. And in Clarissa, Richardson has one of the characters called Lovelace at an incredibly pivotal moment in the plot. I don't worry, I won't give it away. But just as Lovelace is about to do something absolutely atrocious, absolutely ghastly, at this moment, Richardson shows us Lovelace writing this. I have time for a few lines preparative to what is uh, what is to happen in an hour or two, and I love to write to the moment. What may the next two hours produce? Obviously, this doesn't add anything to the plot. It's not about plot. It's not really about narrative, but it does add a sense of realness, a sense of immediacy. We see this fictional character, obviously, but we see this fictional character presented to us um, as though the story hasn't happened yet, as though it's unfolding. We have this fictional character anticipating what might be about to happen and recording their thoughts in the heat of the action. This is writing to the moment. So we're not being told the story in the past tense. We're being told the story as if it's still in the process of happening. And we're shown characters writing their thoughts in this moment as things are happening or are about to happen. So it brings a sense of immediacy. We're caught up in the moment as well because it's as though this story hasn't happened yet. And we're sitting here with Lovelace worrying about what is indeed going to happen over the next two hours or so. Back to Eloisa. We'd just read the opening lines of the poem. We then encounter Eloisa as she's writing out Abelard's name, as if she's starting a response letter to him, as if she's writing out dear Abelard. Dear fatal name. Oh, write it not, my hand. The name appears already written. Rush it out, my tears. So we experience Eloisa kind of in the process of writing. Eloisa speaks to her hand, asking it not to write Abelard's name, not to start this letter. But almost unconsciously, her hand has already written his name and then her tears are washing it away. So the hyphens leave breaks and pauses, but they compress the time in between. So it reads as a series of kind of immediate moments. Writing to the moment, as I've already mentioned, became an important feature of other writing in the 18th century. But it's perhaps more subtle in Pope. Um, but as I hope I've shown, Eloise to Abelard is an important precursor in terms of technique to epistolary novelists like Samuel Richardson. And I just want to give you another quick example, this time from Richardson's Pamela um, from 1740, again, published after Eloise to Abelard. Um, and this is a, is a picture uh, that describes uh, a scene within the novel in which Mr. B, that's the man who's entering the room, kind of encounters Pamela um, as she's writing some of her letters. And uh, I want to give you an example of the kind of letter that Pamela is writing. The kind of conceit of the novel Pamela is that it's a series of letters from Pamela back home to her parents, kind of uh, recounting all the I was going to say adventures, but all the kind of misfortunes that happen to her in the house of the rakish uh, Mr. B, who keeps trying to um, attack Pamela, essentially. 
Um, and this is what she writes. And I just want you to think about how the same techniques we can see here in Pamela's writing, um, as we could see in Eloise's. I can hardly write, yet as I can do nothing else, I know not how to forbear. Yet I cannot hold my pen, how crooked and trembling the lines. I must leave off till I can get quieter fingers. Why should the guiltless tremble so when the guilty can possess their minds in peace? You can see how Richardson develops the same form and techniques as Pope had done in order to convey a sense of immediacy, the sense of that us readers are experiencing a mind in action, the use of hyphens to compress time, the use of yet and the present tense, the use of a character kind of describing their state as things are happening, so words like trembling, um, and the rhetorical self-questioning mode. I want to close by reading another passage from Eloisa to Abelard that shows the metatextual writing to the moment elements in action. Um, we also get a real sense of immediacy of seeing this tortured mind as it's roving around its conflicted thoughts. It shows the oscillation of her mind. One moment she wants Abelard to write to her and the next moment she doesn't. Then she wants to forget him and then she wants or thinks she wants him to forget her. Yet write, O oh write me all, that I may join griefs to thy griefs and echo sighs to thine. Nor foes nor fortune take this power away. Is my Abelard less kind than they? Tears still are mine, and those I need not spare. Love but demands what else were shed in prayer. No happier task these faded eyes pursue. To read and weep is all they now can do. Ah, come not, write not, think not once of me, nor share one pang of all I felt for thee. Thy oaths I quit, thy memory resign. Forget, renounce me, hate whate'er was mine. Fair eyes and tempting locks, which yet I view. Long loved, adored ideas, all adieu. Thanks for listening. I hope you've enjoyed uh, perhaps enjoy isn't quite the right word, but I hope it's been illuminating looking at uh, Eloise's roving mind in action. If you like what I do, then subscribe to my channel to see more of my weekly videos, close reading classic literature.